little. I see it. Pause on it. Happy Friday, Bruce. Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine. Anna. Friends of Baylor. A lot to talk about this week. I thought, you know, things have died down. Nothing to talk about. We got a lot to talk about. So first of all, interesting what's happening in the world. We were coming down, and then you can clearly see the, B, the, the Omicron BA.2 spike. And there's some hot spots still. Uh, same ones as last week, Australia, Chile, most of Europe, Hong Kong, and now Shanghai. And so what's really interesting is China is in the midst of a very big surge. It's, you can see for them, it's a big peak. Again, the scale of it is still smaller than what we've had in the United States, but it's a big peak for them. And the biggest problem has really been Hong Kong. And, you know, Hong Kong is a very, very dense city, and they're, they're experiencing a peak that's really equivalent to what they experienced in Wuhan. And the interesting about, thing about Hong Kong is it's, you know, got a lot of elderly population that was not really vaccinated. So they, they did a very good job at preventing their population from, from getting infected, but now that Omicron's there, uh, they're really struggling. And there's a, you know, both in terms of new cases and hospitalization. But interestingly enough, Shanghai now is really in, in the middle of a new surge. And there are 25 million residents of Shanghai. And, you know, you combine that with the fact that the Sinovac isn't all that great, they have decided to lock down the city in two phases. In one phase, uh, they're going to try and shut down half of the city and test everybody, 12 and a half million residents. And then they're going to do it again in the, uh, in the other part of the city. And the idea is to try to identify as many cases as they can and then lock everything down. So, you know, it's kind of a blunt force tool to, <laughs> you know, if you can't deal with it, you lock everything down, test everyone. But that's what they're doing, and hopefully they'll get it under control. But we'll see. It's not the way... You know, it's not the way I'd like to do it, but that's the way they're, they're doing it. Interestingly enough, in Europe, Europe's had that second big spike. It's not quite as bad as the original peak, but it is going up, and it's really associated with loosening of restrictions. Uh, South Africa's same thing. They're loosening their restrictions. Uh, there are now new coronavirus cases increasing in Europe in 18 different countries, Britain, France, Germany, Italy, as I showed you. And most everybody thinks it's really just the impact of loosening restrictions. So originally, you know, I and this is relevant to Houston, I'll get to that in a second. The U.S., of course, is still way down, and we usually follow what happens in Europe by two to three weeks. So I fully anticipate that we'll begin to see a spike up. But again, right now, we're, we're looking really good. So last week, we had only four hot spots, Idaho, uh, the panhandle of Texas, Arkansas, and Kentucky. And right now, it's really just the panhandle of Texas and Kentucky. So we're doing very well. But if you look at the CDC wastewater, we're beginning to see some jumps up. Same places as last week, Ohio, Illinois, and Wisconsin. But you'll notice a little bit of an increase in our region. And actually, the Houston uh, wastewater project has identified a slight bump from 18 to 25 percent of its baseline uh, uh, value. And so, you know, I'm anticipating we are going to see the hump that the IHME has predicted. And just to remind you, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation from the University of Washington has predicted we'll begin to see a little bit of a hump. Now, you know, I was originally thinking we would see that because of the rodeo. But, you know, we actually haven't seen that. And I, my guess is it's more like what's going on with Europe. If you look at Houston, we've actually eliminated most of our restrictions. So, you know, you go into a grocery store these days, no one's wearing a mask. You know, there's very little restrictions. And so my guess is it's the combination of the BA.2 here, as well as loosening restrictions, just like in Europe, that'll be responsible for our little increase. But still right now, we're doing well. It, you can see from last week, we've gone up. We were down below 10 cases. This week, we're at 25 in Harris County. Our brethren, <laughs> Dimmick County, are still hanging in there. And Lipscomb County is actually the highest right now, 250 cases per 100,000. And the Texas Medical Center, you know, our, our, we've had a, we had a little funny blip this week. Not really sure why, so I'm not going to report it. I think it's probably an anomaly uh, of reporting. But the hospitalizations have stayed down. So we're, we were down to below 100. We jumped to 103 last week, and we're down below 100 again. So hospitalizations look really good. And amazingly enough, even though... It doesn't have a lot of new bodies to infect. BA.2 is really outcompeting BA.1 pretty aggressively. It's now 55% of 
of all of the uh, viral uh, variants. So let's talk about complications of COVID. We, we were beginning to do this, and you know there have been a number of editorials recently that there's going to be a tsunami of cardiovascular disease. Uh, one of our faculty members, Beacon Bosker, was featured in the Houston Chronicle talking about that uh, as, a, as a cardiologist. And the reason is there's been a couple of studies that suggest that COVID uh, infection does yield uh, some cardiovascular risk. So there was a paper in Nature Medicine that looked, it's out of the VA, looked at 153,000 veterans who were infected with COVID-19, looked at two different controls, one that was contemporaneous uh, controls, 5,000 controls that could identify uninfected people, and then 5,000 historical controls. And basically what they showed was that cardiovascular problems uh, were seen in 58% more likely in the COVID infected groups than in the uh, controls. And that it's really kind of dramatic if you look at these, the, the numbers. If you were uh, infected with COVID, any kind of cardiovascular syndrome, there's a much higher probability that you, you had some cardiac complication. Uh, and if you look at it, it also correlated with the severity of the disease. So the more severe the disease, the worse the cardiac complication. So this is a really um, good graph that shows you if you were in the ICU, any cardiovascular complication was dramatically increased. The interesting thing is it also is in arrhythmia. So the arrhythmia category was particularly uh, impacted by COVID. So there was another study uh, in the American Journal of Medicine looking at a similar kind of thing. And what they looked at was injury of the myocardium during infection. So we've talked a lot about the myocarditis that people get after vaccination, but COVID itself causes that. And they saw injury to the myocardium in 30% of hospitalized patients and 55% of those who had previous cardiovascular disease showed some evidence of um, injury. There's been some discussion because ACE2 is so common in the cardiac myocytes and the vascular tissue that the virus might actually get into cardiac tissue. That's been a debated point. There's been a couple of studies and autopsy studies showing presence of viral particles, but others haven't shown that, so it's not clear that it actually gets in or, or replicates in the, in the muscle tissue itself. But they have been, it, it would make sense. The ACE2 receptor is the receptor for the virus to entry, enter. So there's a lot of studies that keep suggesting that if you had COVID, there's a significant risk to you. What are the other risks besides cardiovascular risks? We've talked about people who are vulnerable to getting COVID, severe COVID, are the elderly, people with obesity, hypertension, diabetes. But it turns out men are more likely to be infected. So why is that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, we, men have more, a sort of a higher density of ACE2 receptors. Those are the receptors that bring the virus in. There's also so, uh, lifestyle issues, like there's higher levels of smoking and drinking in men compared to women. But here's my favorite. This is, this is one of the risk factors that come out, why men are more likely to be sensitive to the COVID. It's because women have a more responsible attitude toward COVID-19 pandemic than men. Uh, men are, ir are irresponsibly in their, in their managing of masks, in hand washing, in stay at home orders. So men just don't follow orders very well. So that's one of the other possibilities why men are more affected. But on a scientific basis, there was a really interesting study in Nature Genetics that showed actually that on the X chromosome, there is a locus that down-regulates the ACE2 receptor. Uh, and if you have two of those, you down-regulate it more. And the most important thing about this particular study is it showed that if you had down-regulation of your ACE2 receptor, more common in women, that you had a less likely chance of getting COVID infected. So there's the first real example of where the, the number of ACE2 receptors correlates with the amount of infection. So very, very interesting study. And I want to end today with a vaccine update. This week, uh, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration expanded the use of uh, uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines now for a fourth dose, a second booster in adults over the age of 50. If you recall, previously it had been anyone over the age of 12 who was immune compromised. And this finally answers my sister's question and also my friend Tom Kaplan who asked, when could I get my fourth dose? Well, I guess you can get it now. Now the real issue, it's kind of interesting, Right now in this country, we have very low levels of virus replication. We're likely to see a bump in the spring and then maybe a resurgence in the fall. You might want to consider getting your vaccine in a month or two because that'll give you peak uh, protection in the fall, but 
uh, it's up to you. It's now uh, the FDA has approved it, and they approve it at, uh, four months after your previous vaccine. So I want to end today with a shout out. I'm very proud of my dermatologist, uh, Dr. Zena Nawaz, who, with her colleague, uh, was traveling to a dermatology meeting. She's a dermatologist with internal medicine training. And they actually were called on a flight to save a man who had an MI. And so she did that. She was in the news. And most importantly, she's a fine uh, Baylor physician. And I'm very proud of her because she's my dermatologist. Anyway, congratulations to you, Dr. Nawaz, and your team. Uh, and I can't wait to see you next week.